So we are back, and it is Monday morning, uh, March 15th. Chapter 24 wrapping up, starting 25, the Amin chapter, and that will be our uh, final chapter for this section for, what, test three coming up uh, next week. Don't worry, it's not this way <laughs> next week. Uh, homework nines for tonight, corresponding to chapter 24. And quiz seven is not posted yet, but it will be uh, shortly there. Questions on anything? And I think also we have no class Friday, right? This is our spring break weekend coming up. So I'll remind you of that on, uh, on Wednesday. But just to plan ahead there, uh, test three is over those three chapters, right? Uh, 23, 24, 25 here. So we're looking at enolate chemistry and a little bit of amine chemistry here added at the end. And to review a little bit, uh, well, here's a couple examples of this conjugate addition or Michael addition that we left off with last time. So you see an enone here, and then you see the acetoacetate with uh, typical conditions here, sodium uh, methoxide and methanol. And you're given the product here. I think we can figure out that mechanism together. So there's a few spots we could form enolates, right? Uh, there's multiple spots, actually. But with sodium methoxide, there's a spot where we can what? Uh, irreversibly form an enolate because the pKa there is so low, right? 10 being in between the two carbonyls. So to start out with, we take our anion here and uh, deprotonate there. And then we'd have our, um, our uh, ester and our enolate. Well, let's just leave it right there in the middle. <laughs> we could draw that, you know, uh, anionic charge out onto the two oxygen. That's why it's so low. That's why it's a pK10. And then here's our Michael acceptor, we say, or our conjugate addition acceptor. This is our electrophile, right? It's electrophilic at this uh, beta position. And we call that, what, 1,4 addition or conjugate addition or Michael addition. Michael, the professor at Tufts about 100 years ago, uh, did these type of reactions with stabilized enolates, adding enones or unsaturated ketones. It's different than the cuprate additions. Those are organometallic reagents. Uh, that came later on by Gilman, uh, an organometallic chemist. These are stable uh, enolates. So let's do the mechanism here. Push the electrons up and electrophilic at that beta position. So we'll get what? O minus, and we get a new enolate. And, you know, these aren't as reactive a nucleophiles as some that we've seen. So they do the conjugate addition to give a stabilized enolate intermediate. Now that is a higher energy thing, right? Because this pKa was 10, this pKa here is about 20, okay? So it's not gonna be the same thing. In fact, there's a couple ways we could do the mechanism now to get to the final product. And notice we're not heating it up and we're not treating with strong acid. We could do that and what? Hydrolyze our ester and then decarboxylate. So maybe we'll show that extra step here. But right now, just how do we get from here to here? Well, we've got to just protonate uh, right there. Or look, here we have the, uh, the uh, pKa of 10 hydrogen, right? We had two of them after all. So we could do this and get our neutral ketone up there in the ring and have our ester here and our uh, ketone here, but now we'd have that, right? <clears throat> and then how do we get to the final product? Well, uh, we could add then dilute acid at this point, okay, and get the, uh, get the final product there. Uh, we do have methanol, which would be a proton source as well, okay? That's not a great proton source in this case because that is what? That is pKa10. So you really need to acidify it, like before with the clason, with dilute acid, okay? But not acid and heat. Let's do the thing where we actually <laughs> blast this with more acid and heat, right? Now we're gonna what? Hydrolyze this to the carboxylic acid, and then what? We can decarboxylate, right? And we can go to this type of product. 
where we'd have our uh, ketone over there and no more of that. That came off with the carbon dioxide, the decarboxylation. And I think you can draw the rest of that mechanism, so that helps to review a little bit there. But uh, yeah, it's called the Michael addition or conjugate addition. With stable um, uh, nucleophiles that are of moderate basicity, okay? They're all around nine or 10, most of them. In fact, here's another one, benzyl sulfide. So this is a benzyl group. It has benzene and a methylene and then SH. Remember the sulfides are analogous to alcohols. Sulfur's right below oxygen in the periodic table there. So it's uh, divalent. It's the two pairs of electrons. And the other thing is it's a weaker bond. Sulfur hydrogen bonds are weaker. They're more easily ionized, more polarizable. Uh, it's not based on electronegativity because sulfur is more electropositive than oxygen. It's about 2.8 on the Pauling scale, whereas oxygen is 3.5. So that argument is not that. It's, it's mainly due to the size of this being bigger than the hydrogen now, and this is a weaker bond. Yeah, it is still electronegative, so a base can take that proton off, and you get uh, benzyl sulfide anion. So that's the first step. You form water and the sulfur uh, nucleophile. And now this also adds in a conjugate manner. Okay. pK is about 10 here. pK of water is right 15. So that is favorable to form that. We'd say that's what? An irreversible base in that case. Okay. Depends on what the difference is in pK. But if we add like that, what do we get? Again, a enolate and our sulfur is there and a benzyl group is there so here what do we need to do we need to add uh, a proton there and water would be sufficient to do that because our pka of that ketone enolate is around 20 right so the water would do a good job of that give us our neutral guy back and our benzyl sulfide at that position so another Michael conjugate addition, but with a different nucleophile in this case. Here it's our old friend uh, acetoacetate anion, and here it's a different one. We looked at cyanide before, I think, but they're all kind of in that range of uh, 9 or 10 pK. Questions on this? Any of this? Okay. Well, let's move ahead and look at the complicated example now, I think, the Robinson annulation? Yeah, okay. So here's Robinson. He's a British chemist, Robert Robinson, in the early uh, 20th century. Um, did a lot of different uh, contributions. And main thing is his annulation reaction or ring forming reaction, we say. An annulus means a ring. So it's a combination of things, a Michael addition followed by some enol late transfer steps, and then finally an aldol condensation reaction. So it's a multi-step or cascade type reaction, you could say, that triggers a number of things. So let's get uh, the first step up here anyway and see what we're looking at. So here we have a diketone plus methyl vinyl ketone KOH. <clears throat> okay, You can do this in water, THF. And we're going to keep it at room temperature, and this step is going to be pretty fast. <clears throat> and you can see this is just what? This is just a, uh, a Michael addition, right? So here's the one, two, three, four carbons of the methyl vinyl ketone going on here, and we know how to form that, that enolate, right? So the first step of the Robinson. Uh, annulation is just uh, this Michael addition. So let's review that. So we got a hydrogen here. We can take off of KOH, right? And we've got the anion there. And it is resonance stabilized. So we can uh, push that up to the two oxygens. The pK that we'd expect to be quite low at 10. And then our next step is what? Our Michael addition. And that will give us the uh, 
the new enolite here. <laughs> we trade one enolite for another enolite. And you'd say, well, you know, this enolite's more stable. This is pKa of 10, right? This enolite here, pKa is about 20. So why does this reaction work at all? Well, you are getting a new carbon-carbon bond here, okay? So that is favorable. But you're right, the uh, enolite is less stable, so we'd say that's higher in energy, okay? We haven't gone down to the neutral product yet. But you can see how that's gonna go, right? So just with water here, we're gonna bring the electrons back and then protonate. And you see that generates some more base, okay? Now, if we keep it at room temperature here and just do it for an hour or so, we can get a very good yield of this. Okay, which is just the Michael addition. We've already seen that before, okay? But let's see what happens now if we heat this up and let this keep going, okay? Now, um, what else can occur in this reaction? Well, let's draw that product again. We got it down here on the next board. We'll take our time with this and make sure we understand each step. So here's our product of that first step. And like, like I said, we could isolate at this point and get a decent yield. But we're going to blast this now. So KOH, heat, and more time. 12 hours. Okay. And what are we going to get? We're going to get this. <laughs> I like to draw the product so you have a road map of where we're going here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So there's a new ring. So this is why it's called the annulation reaction, annulus being a ring. And let's see, we had two ketones in the cyclohexane before. Now we've only got the one. You see the methyl group that was right here? It's still there. And you can count all the carbons. There's four carbons here. So what do we need to do here, really? We need to connect this carbon with that right there and eliminate uh, water, okay? And that will be an aldol condensation reaction. <laughs> so how are we going to get there? Well, our first step is going to be taking a proton off here, right? And deprotonating right there. Now there's a number of spots we could deprotonate. We'll talk about that in more detail here in a second, but let's get this one on there. And oh, I drew it a, a different way, didn't I? <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. Okay, one, two, three, four. Yeah, make sure you got them all there in the methyl group there. Now, why did I deprotonate there? We could have deprotonated here. That would have been a more substituted enolate. That pKa is actually a little bit lower than the one out on the end. Two other spots we could have deprotonated. Do you see where they are? Where else could we have deprotonated here? I like to point out the uh, alternative pathways. What about here? We could have deprotonated there. We could have deprotonated here. But look at our roadmap. We're going toward forming this next ring. So if we have this here, look, we're able to cyclize right there. Okay? And that would be that new six-membered ring. Now that argument's okay. <laughs> you should recognize though that this is what? Reversible now. And we are actually forming these other enolates. But why do we not have to worry about those? The next step's what? The next step is this cyclization. So if we cyclize here, what's that gonna to do to our equilibrium? It's gonna to begin to uh, supply a shock to it, right? By Le Chatelet's principle, and remove this and form the, the more stable product. Well, couldn't these cyclize here? Look, if we had an enolate here, we could cyclize over to this ketone. One, two, four, five, six, okay? That would actually be a bridge bicyclic structure that would have more strain associated with it. If we cyclize here, we're actually forming a fused bicyclic structure, which is the Robinson annulation product. So we could consider these other pathways of cyclizing from this enolate here over to there, but you see then we'd have these, the, the ketone here bridging, and we wouldn't be able to eliminate water there and have an alkene at that bridgehead position. That would be highly strained. You can experiment with that if you'd like. Same thing over here. In fact, that's symmetric right there. That would also 
be a, a six-membered ring that would be uh, strained. We could also think about this enolate adding here. What size ring would that be? One, two, three, four-membered ring. That would be more strained just based on angle strain. Okay, so there are some alternative pathways here, but you should keep in mind, you know, where we're going for the Robinson annulation. And so let's uh, cyclize here, get our new product in there, six membered ring, right? And O minus, and what else do we need here? Oh, we need the ketone right there, okay. Now, you know, we have to rotate around these bonds and get it in the right conformation. If we rotate it around there, you see this will be in closer proximity to that. And that's okay. We can rotate around those sigma bonds and get to this point. So this is an aldolate. What do we need to do here? Well, we got water. We got a proton source already in the reaction, right? <clears throat> and we are going to a higher temperature. And what did we say about that delta here, 100 degrees? And that's what? That's the aldol condensation conditions, right? With that higher temperature, because we're going to have to eliminate water here. Now, if we did this reaction for an extended time at a lower temperature, we could actually isolate this. <laughs> okay, so we're kind of going to the end of the road here. Uh, the most thermodynamically stable thing would be have this double bond in place because then we get the resonance conjugation. There's another thing we have to do here, though. We have more hydroxide. We have to pull that proton off. And we have to form the enolate here. And remember, <clears throat> this enolate's important to form. And to show that, don't just push these electrons right over and kick off OH. That's a different mechanism. That's an E2 mechanism. Remember we said it doesn't do E2. Alcohols on their own like that don't eliminate. Use the carbonyl that's next door to form what? The conjugate base of this intermediate, right? So what do we call this mechanism? E1CB, okay? Where CB stands for conjugate base. And then it is unimolecular. This can then eliminate OH and go to the, go to the product. Okay, so does that make sense, those steps so far? Okay, do you think you can practice that uh, different directions and, and figure that out? So, <clears throat> you know, if you combine it with the board above, how many steps is it? Deprotonation, addition, and then protonate. So that's three steps just to get to this, right? And then how many more steps? Four, five, six, seven, eight steps. Okay, so you see why the Robinson is considered, I think, uh, the most complicated mechanism we'll cover uh, in the semester. And if you can master it, you're reviewing numerous reactions, right? You're reviewing the Robinson, you're reviewing the idea of uh, enolate formation, and then you're reviewing uh, the aldol, which is from here on out, the aldol reaction, and by eliminating water here, it's the aldol condensation reaction. So it's a combination of the Michael, the aldol, and then the loss of the uh, OH at that point. Questions on that? Okay. We could have some variations on the methyl vinyl ketone. We could have some variations on the, uh, on the dione here, or the methyl group. Okay, so there'll be some examples where you can do that. Let me show you one here that's involving steroid chemistry. If there's no questions on this, anything you want to review there? Okay, yeah. Shh. What's that? Why can't it do an E2? Yeah, so what would be this here, where if we pull that and then have that, it'd go to the same product, right? <laughs> That'd be a different mechanism. Now, do alcohols on their own do this type of reaction? So here's a simpler looking E2 with an alcohol, right? What's wrong with that? Well, this pKa is super high. <laughs> That's an alkane. That's around 50. And again, this is breaking a relatively stable carbon-oxygen bond in a what? Concerted bimolecular manner. It just doesn't happen. 
we can't form alkenes from alcohols using base like this. But this reaction doesn't work. So if you invoke that same mechanism here, we'll take off points because uh, you can't just grab these electrons and have them flow right in to that sigma star and then uh, break off to form that directly. It first forms the, the new enolate, okay? And you see that pKa is about 20. So you can form some of that reversibly. And then once you have this enolate, then it loses OH there. So yeah, it's kind of a technicality. <laughs> uh, we're not being nitpicky though. <laughs> It does fall out of the, the kinetics of the reaction. It is known to be unimolecular once you form this new enolate. It's not bimolecular. Okay? It doesn't depend on the concentration of both of these. And related to simple alcohols, this one doesn't work. So by analogy, we know this mechanism is not operative. It's this conjugate base mechanism. Is that enough on that? You see the difference a little bit more? Yeah, it is kind of nitpicky. If you want to just keep track of it this way, it's okay, right? This goes directly to that. <laughs> yeah, but don't be in a rush. Draw, draw out the, the individual steps there, okay? All right, let's look at the steroid application. This is what Robinson was uh, kind of known for, I think. And I'm not going to draw, well, I'll draw out the whole steroid to begin with, maybe. And, you know, six-member rings, that's kind of a hallmark of, of steroid chemistry. The A ring does have an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone there. There is a methyl group there. There's another six-member ring up there. And then a five-membered ring right here with a ketone. Okay. And this is called uh, androstenone, one of the androgen male hormones. And you see here the alpha beta unsaturated ketone right there. Okay. So what this goes back to, so retrosynthetic arrow here, it goes back to this uh, methyl ester actually. <laughs> this methyl ester uh, is the actual product of the aldo reaction. This methyl ester has to be converted into this methyl group. So there's a, a few steps here to get past this retrosynthetic arrow. But this shows you the functionality that can be used for a Robinson annulation, right? So what does this go back to? Well, it goes back to this ketone now in the B ring. And these steroid rings are named A, B, C, D. Maybe you've seen that before. So this is the B ring here where we'd have that methyl ester and we'd have the methyl ketone here and a ketone there. And you see that would be the aldol reaction then to put the alpha beta and saturated thing in place. And it's actually done with sodium methoxide in methanol and in heating it up. So you can kind of see, and we use methoxide in this case because this is methyl ester. We don't want to hydrolyze that. If we use hydroxide here, we'd add here and get the carboxylate. So there are some variations to this. But then what does this go back to? You can see uh, the B ring then. And those are the connections to the C ring. I'm just abbreviating that. So we'd have the methyl ester, the ketone here. There's our hydrogen in between the two carbonyls. You see, pK of about 10. And then our other reacting partner is again methyl vinyl ketone, MVK. Okay. And you see MVK used all over the place in the Robinson annulation. That's because it can accept, you know, a nucleophile here, the beta position, do the conjugate addition. And then we have to protonate here, and then we have to deprotonate here. Now remember that's a two-step thing. Initially we form the enolate right here, but that's not the one that can cyclize. That would be a four-membered ring. We have to protonate there with methanol in this case, and then deprotonate here with methoxide, and then that's the one that gets the aldol going. Okay, But I think from that you can see how that maps on to this right here. We're forming that and that, and, you know, we've got to convert that methyl ester. <laughs> and 
that's actually done by first putting a protecting group here, the ethylene glycol, reducing this with LAH to the primary alcohol, converting it to a tosylate, and then more LAH reduces that primary tosylate to, uh, to a methyl group. So it's actually a couple more steps there. But yeah, don't worry about that. Just look at the, the Robinson uh, issue right now. Is that OK? Questions on that? All right, let's do a little bit of uh, drug synthesis and show some biological examples here. We'll go up to the uh, overheads, the graphics that are available on Learning Suite there. And aspirin is still the number one drug. Uh, it's called a wonder drug. Treats a lot of different conditions, right? Pain and fever. It's very inexpensive. It's made synthetically from benzene, which comes out of coal tar here goes back to the 1800s uh, when this was developed. Um, you take the, the benzene that you get from coal tar, you crush it and then steam distill it, and out comes enough benzene. You treat that with propene and HF, and you get cumene, isopropyl benzene. That's also aviation fuel right there. And then there's a great industrial reaction here. You treat this with peroxide and a copper iron catalyst, and then initially does a benzylic hydroxylation. You treat with acid and you get a migration here and uh, the byproduct, the isopropyl group comes off as acetone actually. And the other product is phenol. That's the only one I'm showing here. But this step right here creates two important industrial molecules, phenol and acetone. And then you treat uh, phenol here with carbon dioxide and base. Well, what does that do? Well, the KOH can deprotonate, right? You can form the phenolate, right? And that phenolate is really an enolate, right? You can have electron density at this alpha position on that phenolate. And that can actually attack CO2, okay? So this is crushed dry ice, you put that in there. And then there's a tautomerization step after it adds to CO2. We could go through that mechanism. I think you can figure it out though. And it prefers to do the ortho product. This is called salicylic acid. Once you acidify, you have to add dilute acid to get this salicylate. That's also available in different plants, willow trees. And historically, that's where ancient peoples uh, use this material to control pain and fever. So this isn't a new medicine at all. This is the natural product right here. <laughs> Of course, it's easier to make it synthetically here from these steps. And then you isolate it here to give the uh, material that's a little gentler on the stomach. Salicylic acid will create more stomach acid and can lead to some problems there. So Colby and Von Baer, they, they found out that if you isolate it, and this is just acetic anhydride, a reaction we've seen before, which forms an ester here of the phenol alcohol. And there it is, that's actually in the drug. It also forms the anhydride here of the benzoate on the salicylic acid. But that's just hydrolyzed with water. An anhydride is more reactive than an ester. So you can easily hydrolyze that and keep the ester. And then you crystallize it out and you can do it on very large scale. So it's produced on ton scale worldwide and used to treat uh, a number of conditions. They're a very inexpensive drug. It's an NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, which shuts down prostaglandin synthesis in the body. So the mechanism of how this works, we've mentioned that a little bit when we studied uh, prostaglandins. But yeah, aspirin, certainly still a wonder drug, I'd say. Um, we will see the aldol reaction later on here when we do glycolysis, and this is metabolism, right? This is the conversion of glucose or blood sugar into pyruvate. This occurs in the cytosol of the cell once glucose gets into a cell. And look at all these steps here. ATP is involved. Uh, we go to fructose from glucose. Uh, we put on another phosphate. And the ring open formed here lets us see the retroaldol reaction. That'll have a ketone at this two position. And we'll see we can break this bond right here. This gets us down to the two three carbon units. That reaction we'll see <laughs> in, in real clarity later on. I'm just telling you, it is coming up. We will use the aldol reaction again. In the forward direction here, there's a process called gluconeogenesis, where the body or organisms can create glucose de novo from these two three carbon ketone 
aldehyde structures, gap and dap. So we'll see that in the forward direction. Actually, the same enzyme, aldolase, does that same coupling to eventually make glucose in the body. Uh, we'll see uh, an aldol reaction in the citric acid cycle right here, deprotonating acetyl-CoA to form the enolate right there, and then adding to that ketone, and then transferring a proton. There's citrate. Okay, We make that bond right there from an aldol reaction. And then there's some isomerization, some oxidations, and then there's loss of CO2. There's carbon dioxide coming off in a couple spots. And those are the two carbons coming from acetate. Okay, So we'll go into more details of this, and we'll see some other things going on here, some oxidations with NAD+. Okay, <laughs> So some of the reactions we've uh, told you about, we'll look at the details of that later on. Now, I like to point this one out early on, fatty acids. We've talked about those before, the long chain hydrocarbon of fat materials. And they're typically all even numbers here. 18 and 16 and higher animals are more common. But there's 14 and 12 uh, total carbons here. Acyl caryoprotein is a thioester. And here's the synthesis. It's one acetate at a time. Why are they always even numbers of carbons? Well, they're built up from two carbons of it at a time, from acetate, two carbons here. When this adds to one thioester, you go from two here, four carbons there, to six carbons there. And what reaction is that? Well, tetrahedral intermediate, bring the electrons back down, kick off the thiol. That's what? That's a Claisen reaction. <laughs> okay. So Claisen did his work many years before the biochemists actually found the natural analog of this reaction in cells. But nature, of course, you know, it's the same in the lab or, or in a cell, right? So we'll see the Claisen reaction later on. And then you can uh, reduce this ketone here, and we'll show you those steps to the six carbon fatty acid of the acyl protein. Then you can add more here, more acetyl-CoA, and you go to an eight carbon fragment, and on up, 10, 12, 14, 16, whatever. So it's modular that way. Uh, nature is fantastic, I think, in that regard. All right, questions on any of that? And just know, you know, the basics of what, what we're talking about there. Um, let's see, what do we have? Oh, chapter 25. So what do we need to know here? Amines. Well, we've already covered amines, haven't we? And we know what amines are. They're nitrogen-containing uh, organic compounds, different chains on them. I've even mentioned primary amines versus secondary versus tertiary, depending on how many alkyl groups are on there. We'll do a little on naming, a little on structure, not much. They're like alcohols. They are polar. They can hydrogen bond, so they'll be soluble in water. So they're ideal for biology, right? Doing reactions in water, in living systems. In fact, nitrogen is often the limiting factor uh, nutrient-wise. It's a precious element in the biosphere. So organisms treat it with great care, recycling the nitrogen that's available. And we'll see that's essential, right, to make amino acids that are needed for the building blocks in nature. So these amines become very critical for living systems. You know, living organisms bring in a lot of oxygenated materials from glucose, from sugars, whatever, and breathing in, you know, oxygen, whatever. But where's the nitrogen coming from? Well, it needs to be acquired, okay? So we'll see some... Uh, talk about some applications of it. Uh, the synthesis, we've already done some alkylations, so some of these reactions are fine. The Gabriel synthesis will be new with the thal imid. Um, reductive amination is kind of new, but that's via the aminium ion with a hydride reduction source. So it's just a simple little variation. So there's two new reactions. Then we'll talk about basicity, including the heterocyclic compound set. It'd be a little more complicated. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Hoffman elimination. These are quaternary ammonium salts that can be eliminated from the less substitute alkene. That's all I want to say there. We'll just skip that section. It won't be on our test. Is that okay? Section 12 of, of 25. can omit that. If you want to read it, that's fine. <laughs> We've just got too much, I think. Uh, nitrosation, well, we will do this. We'll take nitrous acid with an aniline compound, uh, and this aniline will be converted into the aromatic diazonium salt. And that's a new reaction. However, we have looked at uh, 
NO2 uh, plus, we have looked at the nitrocele cation. This is nitrosonium anion, uh, or cation, sorry. Where the primary aromatic amine goes to these aromatic diazo salts. And these are very important synthetically. You can take these and treat with various nucleophiles and make all sorts of aromatic structures, including phenol, aromatic iodides, fluorides, which we haven't done before. Those two we, we didn't do with electrophilic aromatic substitution. So this is kind of an extra topic of electrophilic aromatic substitution. A little bit different mechanism there. We can also reduce them with hypophosphorus acid. We can also couple aromatic diazos with other aromatic compounds and make diazo compounds. Two nitrogens between two aromatic structures. These are the dye materials, the food dyes that you've probably heard about. So I'll show you some of these applications. You've probably heard about alkaloids before. They're very uh, common in plants. They're tertiary amines that are basic, that can be protonated. So that's why they thought they resembled the alkaline earth hydroxides at first. But they don't. They're, they're amine compounds. Tertiary amine, nicotine, conine, caffeine, quinine. And you can read about the applications here. But you see they're all nitrogen compounds from plants. Uh, atropine, a lot of them are still used in the clinic for different indications. So you can see some of those there. Morphine, of course, for pain, codeine, uh, cocaine, uh, thebane. A number of these don't have any more uh, legitimate clinical usage. Cocaine, we have analogs of cocaine, which are used lidocaine and procaine to treat uh, local pain, anesthesia. Uh, but cocaine itself is, of course, the illicit drug that's highly abused. Uh, but morphine, if you, hide, if you put two acetates here on morphine, you get heroin. Okay, so some analogs here that are not very good. But uh, you can read through some of those there. Yeah, it just goes on and on. There are hundreds, thousands of these that are known that have different effects. Uh, LS, uh, uh, LSD, lysergic acid, which form hallucinations. The highly toxic materials. And all of these feature the amines, right? I'm showing the neutral form, but under physiological conditions, the nitrogen's protonated. That pK is 9. So at pH 7, these are all protonated. So you can see the structures there uh, make them cationic normally. Um, like that, but yeah. I mean, Hall of Fame, uh, yeah, there's a lot of other, the, the chili pepper, the hot compound from capsaicin from peppers. Dimethyl uh, pyrazine is the potato chip uh, tasting compound, <laughs> flavor wise. Aspartame, the artificial sweetener, is a dipeptide. When we get into amino acids and peptides. And then the dye materials, mauve, which was the William Perkin, the first one, the purple color, stained his lab coat, whatever. That led to all these, uh, the Porcion Brilliant Red. There's our aromatic diazo right there. You'll see a couple more of these. But uh, yeah, a lot of nitrogen compounds we've already uh, mentioned, I think. Some are very nasty smelling. Benzolamine comes out of rotting fish. <laughs> and why do we put lemon juice on rotting fish or seafood in general? It's because we protonate it then, right? With the citric acid, and then that's not volatile anymore. The neutral amine is volatile, it has vapor pressure, and it stinks. You put a little acid on there, you protonate it, and it's not volatile anymore. And then we have some really nasty smelling ones, putrescine and cadaverine. And I'm not even going to go there. Okay, scatol. There are some other illicit drugs here, but yeah, I'm not going to talk about it. Oh, and these, phenethylamines. Uh, people ask about these, and we'll, we'll show a couple neurotransmitters, but not much. Ephedrine or uh, adrenaline, epinephrine, re, uh, produced by the adrenal glands, the fight and flight response compounds. Um, and, and so you see the phenethylamine, there's an ethyl group here, then a benzene, and then an amine, okay? And the amine structure can vary, and the aromatic structure can vary. These are the catecholamines with two alcohols here. This makes it more water-soluble. They don't last very long in the body. They only last a couple minutes there. But if we take off the two OH groups here, we have ephedrine. This comes from mawang, an herb from Asia. And that, along with pseudoephedrine, go into what? Cough drops, okay? These are stimulatory or... or uh, Vasodilators, and they also dilate the, uh, the airway passages in the body so they can be used to treat the symptoms of colds in different uh, conditions. But look, if you take off this hydroxyl, 
you make methamphetamine. If you take out this methyl right here, you have amphetamine, okay? Amphetamine, that's uh, uh, still used clinically, okay? Adderall, I think you've heard of that. Methamphetamine, no. The extra methyl group makes it uh, a little longer lived in the body, and that can create a lot of side effects that are, that are very dangerous, okay? So these are illicit drugs. But some others here, uh, this one, Ritalin, used to treat uh, ADHD conditions, uh, improves attention and concentration uh, in the body. So the, these all impact pathways that are the natural neurotransmitters, okay? And the ones that they impact, of course, are ephedrine, norephedrine, and dopamine, because these are all phenethylamines. These are the eight common neurotransmitters. Any neuroscience guys out there? There's always a couple. Have you seen these before? Probably. <laughs> okay. Well, here are the structures. The most common one is acetylcholine, and that's a quaternary ammonium salt. That uh, controls muscle contraction, uh, also in the central nervous system. Some things there. The catecholamines are the workhorse here, produced by the adrenal glands. Um, and dopamine is also an important one. Uh, probably more important, this is more commonly expressed in the body. These two, ephedrine, norephedrine, are expressed upon uh, uh, stress, high stress conditions. Then we have glutamate and uh, GABA. These are, <laughs> glutamate is an amino acid. There's one of the 20 amino acids you'll have to learn coming up in a later chapter. And that's the excitatory uh, in, in the synapse between two neurons. That will be excitatory. Uh, GABA is the decarboxylated version of glutamine. GABA is gamma amino uh, butyric acid. You see it's a four carbon carboxylic acid. This one is the calming neurotransmitter. This suppresses the, uh, the central nervous system. This one excites it, this one inhibits it. And it's just worth what? One decarboxylation step, okay? So you see how nature kind of uses an economy of structures here. And serotonin, another feel-good one, controls sleep and mood and appetite. Uh, this will come from tryptophan, another amino acid that needs to be decarboxylated. You'll learn that later on. Histamine comes from histidine, another amino acid. It has the imidazole um, side chain here. And that uh, controls the immune response and allergy effects, the vasoconstrictor. Anyway, these are the eight common ones. You don't need to memorize them, but just identify the amine, and we'll talk about the PKAs and the ionization state, the structures, and we'll relate these later to uh, amino acids, okay? But I like to show them right now so you can kind of get a head start on it. And we can relate this to a structure we've already learned, a reaction, let's say. And this is acetylcholine. And there's an enzyme in the body called acetylcholine esterase, okay? Neuromuscular junction. So this is where the neurons come in to the muscles and tell the muscles to contract, to move, okay? And uh, it's in the tenth state here. It'll tell the muscle to tense up if it's got the acetate ester on there. How does it relax? Well, acetylcholine has to hydrolyze that ester. And now choline binds a receptor and says, oh, now you can relax. Okay. It's a, it's a molecular-based event there with the release, the synthesis and the release of acetylcholine and then the hydrolysis of it. Well, that's an ester. How does it work? Okay. Well, we protonate the carbonyl, and this is from the enzyme. Okay. The enzyme also has a serine and alcohol there. The base takes this off, and it'll form a tetrahedral intermediate, and it'll form a new ester here liberating the choline from the tetrahedral intermediate. And then that acetate on the enzyme actually gets hydrolyzed in another step to go back to the free enzyme and acetate. So that's how it gets to these two points. And that's what? Exactly a reaction we've been talking about. Okay, ester hydrolysis. Yeah, there are different steps here, different type of acid, and maybe a different nucleophile coming in. But the idea of a tetrahedral intermediate and then the two free products here, that's very analogous to what we've been doing. Um, we can use amines here for extraction purposes. And this is the idea of, you know, if you have two neutral molecules here that have similar boiling points, how do you separate those? Well, you can protonate one of them, the amine, pKa, what, this is nine. So if we acidify this solution in the separatory funnel, you see the ammonium salt will be in the water, and then we're putting in a heavier nonpolar salt, the methylene chloride, that's where the alcohol will be. 
We can mechanically separate those, right, by letting it drain out. And then we get the water layer, which has the ammonium salt. And we can acidify, we can treat that with hydroxide, get back the neutral amine and do another extraction there. But you see, we have physically separated these just based on their ionization states, which is kind of nice there. We'll talk about that. Oh, food colors. The aryl diazonium uh, intermediate set reaction can be used to make these aryl diazo materials. These are the uh, food dyes that are still approved here. These are, uh, you only need to add a tiny amount of these to color different materials. These are all synthetic. They're natural analogs of all of these, right? There's, there's uh, carotene and lycopene. They don't last as long as these. Some of these are very stable. You see these used in a lot of candy and baked goods and whatever, these kind of type of dyes here, but uh, absorbing in, in different regions there to give these different colors. I'm showing you the nanometer, the lambda max, where they absorb there. You see they're highly conjugated, right? The two diazo nitrogens, or sp2 hybridized, allows for the pi bonds to fully conjugate there between the two aromatics sides, which is kind of neat there. All right, let's... Uh, Go to the board. We got a minute here, I guess. <laughs> See what else we need to uh, to look at here in chapter 25. Moving on there, uh, amines. So yeah, what are we going to say about amines? Well, um, you know, we can alkylate them and have different numbers of alkyl groups on there. They all relate to ammonia, right? And nitrogen has five valence electrons. So I just like to go back to structure and look at the basic things of it. So ammonia, you know, but if we have a, another group on there, say ethylamine, we've still got the same basic structure there, but one of the hydrogens has been replaced with what? An ethyl group. That's a primary amine. And we can put two ethyls on there. Diethylamine. We call it secondary because it has two carbons right on the nitrogen. And then we have uh, triethyl. Okay. <laughs> you can see how this works. Is that it? Let's see. Well, we still have a lone pair here, right? Could we add a fourth? Yeah. We can have quaternary ammonium salts. <laughs> okay. Now we need a counter anion of some kind here. And you can see we could form that with just more ethyl iodide or bromide. And then this would be what? Uh, tetraethyl ammonium iodide. Okay. <laughs> so we can put four up there. It's now plus charge though. Okay. You saw some of those uh, in the structures there. Naming here, we call them alkanamines. And there we take off the, uh, the E and add amine at the end. We can also name them alkyl amines. And this is kind of a prefix name, alkylamine. Um, and you just heard me saying that, right? So the simple one here would be ethanamine. Uh, you know, and what did I call it? I called it ethylamine, okay? And if you have two, it's diethylamine, triethylamine, whatever. Let me jump ahead to a harder one here. What if we have, oh, a cyclopental, uh, and an ethyl and a methyl. So that's what type of an amine? It's a tertiary amine. And how would we name that? Well, we've got the biggest parent structure, which would be the cyclopental amine, okay? Or cyclopentanamine. Let's do the full IUPAC name. <laughs> take cyclopentane, take the E off, cyclopentanamine, okay? And then let's see, we have an ethyl and a methyl also on the nitrogen. So it's kind of like that amide name. We have the capital N, ethyl, and we alphabetize these. Then there's N, methyl, and those are kind of prefix names, right? And then uh, cyclopentanamine. You know, that's, that's about as complicated as we get. The simpler amines are all named like this with di, tri, or, or whatever. If you have multiple different ones, you alphabetize them in the front, okay? Here we need these ends because we could have ethyl or methyl on the parent somewhere here, okay? This is a cyclopentane, but we're not uh, doing that. All right, um, 
Yeah, I think we'll leave it there. Very good. We'll do the aromatic ones and those reactions next time. And yeah, we'll be able to finish this chapter pretty pretty quickly. And I think Friday we do have this uh, this spring break holiday. So we'll probably be finishing it next week, next next Monday. But yeah, Wednesday we'll get through most of it. Okay. It's a very good questions on anything. You guys okay? All right, very good. We'll uh, see you next time. Thank you.